So today we will be uh, discussing about the basic digital design and subsequently large system design which we typically call architectural design and we are talking about the integrated circuit design in particular. So why we are calling it architectural design first of all? You know the basic meaning of architectural design. So there we are talking about maybe the size and shape of rooms etc. how they are arranged. At that time we never think of how to make a wall using bricks. right? So we know that there is a already mature technology that we can lay bricks to make walls, we can put walls to make rooms. Okay, So that is the first level of fundamentals in case of digital system design also that we are uh, typically having some knowledge about the essential design components that we can put together to make larger designs. Now what we are starting from that is something called a top down approach. So I think you are aware of the terminology what is meant by top down approach that we are having a problem at hand. Now we are trying to break it up into smaller sub problems where the sub problems are more or less independent of one another and we can solve them independently compared to the other problems without referring to their uh, solutions so to say. Okay. But we must be having some knowledge about what we are going to get at the so called leaf level. If we consider something like a tree structure that is uh, suppose this is the main problem. Now we try to divide it into smaller sub problems. Obviously there will be some connection between the sub problems but they should be minimal. Now what we are trying to do once again suppose we pick up a particular sub problem and looking for its solution. So we try to break it up further. So that operation goes on for all the so called nodes if we call the sub problem as a node and then finally we will be arriving something that we generally refer to as leaf cells. So what is leaf cell where the solution is already known that means we must have already designed something where this leaf cells are known and then we try to put them together to get our job done. So typically what it starts from the top level problem we call it specification or simply specs. Now starting from specs when we will be talking about leaf cells, so leaf cells will be simple digital cells. I think you, you are aware of something called full adder, you, you must be uh, heard about full adders, half adders, counters etc. So it could be say a full adder, it could be something like a counter. So counter the as the name suggests, it simply counts the number of clock cycles coming. Clock is nothing but a square shaped pulse. So the edges it typically tries to count. What are the other leaf cells that we can have uh, in our hand? Maybe something called a register. So once again as it uh, as the name suggests, register means it can register some number, right? So whatever we are talking about basically that is following binary logic. So binary valued logic means it is essentially having two values namely 0 and 1 and they are typically getting represented by the power supply voltage and the ground <laughs> potential in general though the uh, I mean variants are there but typically that is the general scenario. Now using these two digits or so called bits binary digits we usually call bits so 0 and 1 you can represent large numbers. Now it depends on how many bits you are using for representing the numbers. So I think you are having some fast course on number theory etc. So I am not repeating them. But when you talk about the hardware, where to store it? So there comes the register. So register once again is nothing but a set of so called flip flops. Flip flop you can consider to be something like a memory cell which can store one single bit of information either a 0 or a 1. But it is a kind of volatile memory whenever you switch off the power it forgets whatever you have stored there. So once you have switched it on you have to write something then only the question comes of the reading. There are something else that is called a large memory. So that is something of uh, this nature. It is uh, you can consider something of uh, a notebook. So maybe in the notebook there are several lines where you can write something and each of these lines let us say you have numbered them starting from say first line we are calling 0th line, line number 1, 2 and so on. Now you can typically say that 
I am having some sort of address for each of this line. For example, I want to find out what is written in line number 2. So, I will say that this particular line is having an address 2 and whatever is written here that we will call data stored at location 2. So, this we will call a memory and in hardware it is somewhat similar of uh, the basic flip flops, but it is somewhat more economic compared to the flip flop. So, we are not going to into the design details of uh, this one right now, but functionally it is something like this that memory is a block where we can have some address lines and we are having some data lines. Data lines typically are bidirectional. So, by addressing a particular location, we can write in that location or we can read depending on some other control signal typically called read write type of control signal. So, using them we can read or write from the memory and this is the so called data bus through which we can access that memory, we can write something over there or we can read from that. So, equipped with this uh, kind of hardware we will start the architectural design. So, first of all let us say what we are going to do as we have said that the first thing is the specification. So, what is meant by a specification? It generally is a set of rules or maybe it is a well structured algorithm. So, I think uh, all of you are writing some high level language program right, maybe in C, C++, any other high level language. So, you are trying to solve a particular problem, you are uh, sequentially putting some instruction to solve that, maybe initially you are taking in some data and by some sort of number crunching operation or some sort of logical operation you are trying to arrive at the result. So, that is what you are trying to do when you are writing a high level language program. So, in that case you are starting from the problem statement itself which we may call the specification of the problem. So, similar thing is there also for hardware design particularly when you are talking about VLSI design. So, any IC chip it is supposed to carry out some sort of task, a given task. So, that task when you are representing in terms of some sort of structural uh, statements or algorithm or maybe just a simple English language rules, we call that one as the starting specification. But one thing must be there, the specification must be unambiguous. What we mean by unambiguity is that for a given set of inputs, what should be the output? that must be clearly defined, there should not be any set of inputs that will result in some sort of undefined output. If that is the case then you have to once again specify clearly that this set of inputs will not occur in general or even if it occurs we do not care about the outputs at that particular time instant. Another thing is that all the input combinations must be covered otherwise still there could be some sort of ambiguity. So, maybe as a starting point we can consider that it is a set of algorithms or uh, it is an algorithm which we are starting from and then from that specification we have to derive some sort of hardware. So, the next step after receiving the specification, so as an engineer we may say that specification is our input. So, then we can think of some sort of maybe block diagram where we try to identify the functional blocks we call that one as the architectural design which particularly we are talking about today. So, this architectural design you may consider this something as a block level design. So, this blocks whatever we are referring about is something like a functional block that can carry out a given task. Now, this block level sometimes it is also referred by the te uh, technology people as RTL. What is RTL? it is register transfer level, why the name is there? It is register transfer level. So, register as we have already mentioned that it is essentially storing all the variables. Okay. So, whenever we are talking about specification in terms of say some algorithm, algorithm you are having some variables right. Now, you need to store those variables and then you have to use some sort of as we have mentioned number crunching or that is arithmetic operation or logical operation. For those you have to put some hardware. Now, these registers are storing the variables and there will be some other element for example, adder that might add two operands and give the result at its output which once again you have to store in some register. 
So, essentially we are talking about register to register transfer and some sort of arithmetic or logical operation. So, that is why at this level when we are talking about this architectural design, we call it register transfer level design where these blocks are composed primarily of registers and some arithmetic logic units. But here everything is in block level, we are not going into the details of the internal design that we are actually targeting at the next level which we refer to in general as logic design. So, what is that logic design? Logic design is the step where we try to realize each of these blocks whatever we have mentioned in the architectural design in terms of typically the gate level designs. So, gate level may not exactly mean that you are talking about NAND gate, AND gate or uh, multiplexers or uh, say flip flops. Huh. So, all of them wherever this uh, unambiguous blocks are there because when we say it is an AND gate. So, that means your its functionality is completely <laughs> defined. Only thing maybe we need to mention that it is 2 input AND gate or 3 input AND gate. So, immediately you understand when all the inputs are high the output will be high that is the functionality of the block. Okay. So, in the logic level we are trying to put all these so called gates together to realize the blocks that we have mentioned in the architectural design. Now, finally, this uh, gate level design once again need to be translated into smaller uh, we call it smaller granularity. So, granularity is something when we talk about say pebbles and let us say sands. Okay. So, if you uh, think about that you are um, making maybe some motif using some pebbles, then you will be thinking in one way, but when you know that okay, you are having the granularity level of sand, then possibly you can think of that motif in a slightly different way. Okay. So, this gate level designs whatever we are talking about, maybe here we are talking about say one AND gate, maybe here we talk about multiplexers. I think you are aware what is a multiplexer? You can select uh, out of many inputs to one input. So, all this we call gate level designs. Finally, we are having something we call it circuit design. So, what is that circuit design? Gate level designs once again need to be realized using transistors. right? So, the next step is something like a transistor level design and finally, the transistors how they are realized? I think maybe uh, in the previous lectures you are already aware of the transistor level designs. I think most preliminaries has already been covered. right? So, after this circuit we have to do something called device design. So, that is what the VLSI people are engaged in that the device sizes are now very small. What is the typical dimension of the device right now? Uh -huh. So, it, it comes down to maybe typically tens of nanometers or commercially maybe people are still using 90 nanometer or even higher maybe 130 nanometer technology. Okay. But once again as we have mentioned that when we talk about architectural design we need not think about the brick level at every time instant. We already know that technology is mature to make one gate, one multiplexer using those 0.13 micron technology or 0.045 micron technology whatever. We start from that. So, let us look into uh, a very simple example that how we try to convert a specification into the architectural design. So, it might be like this that a very simple algorithm we can think of that we need to find out the summation of n natural numbers 1, 2 up to n. So, if you write some sort of algorithm without being aware of that there is some closed form formula, then what it would be? We may first of all input the number of terms to be added together. So, it would look something like this input the value of n. So, I am trying to write some sort of pseudo code and then you will possibly initialize some register to 0 or some variable at least at this moment we can still call it a variable and then possibly we will run a loop for i equal to maybe you can start from 1 or 0 does not matter 1 to n. Then what will be the actual uh, logical or arithmetical step? S would be equal to S plus i. So, this loop will continue I am using this next uh, as end of loop and once it comes out of this loop when n is also added then we have to output the value of which variable s. So, that ends the algorithm. Now, obviously we know that this one involves something like uh, 
addition of n terms. So, it will take time, but we also may recall that we can do it by a closed form formula that is n into n plus 1 by 2. So, this one costs less in terms of time, in terms of computational effort. But the problem is in many real life problems, we may not come up with some sort of this closed form formula. So, anyway, since there is a possibility of that one, as we have started with this uh, flow diagram that from specification we are going into architectural design, logic design, etc. So, we can see that at the specification level itself or the algorithm level itself, there is a scope of optimization. Whatever we have uh, just now shown that if we go simply by series summation, then it would take more effort compared to using the closed form formula, right. So, this type of optimization where we are trying to reduce the computational effort is called algorithmic optimization. So, till this point VLSI or any hardware design is not really coming into picture. So, as a VLSI designer, we will assume that the algorithm designer who is already expert in that field must have checked whether there is any optimization possible and whatever the algorithm is given to us, us means the VLSI designers that is an optimized one. So, let us assume for the time being that we are not really aware that this closed form formula is there, algorithm designer has passed this uh, algorithm to us and we are trying to implement this in hardware. Then what would be the kind of hardware uh, we can put over there. Now, first of all we need to identify how many different variables are there, why that is required because we need to engage registers for storing those variables. So, one is n another one is S, another one is I, right. So, we require at least three registers, one for storing the value of N, another for storing the value of I, another for storing the value of S. However, as we can see that this I needs to be incremented every time. So, rather than using a simple register, we can choose a, what we can choose? We can choose a counter. Okay. So, just I mean this is a non-standard notation, I am just using this. So, this one let us say it means a counter. Now, as soon as we put this, then the variables, uh, their storage requirement that has been taken care of. Now, let us look into the uh, statements themselves. First of first statement is input n. So, what provision should I have to make that this is the register n which will be storing the value given by the user from outside. So, there must be some external connection if there is a external bus from there, there must be a connection coming to n by which user can provide the value of n and it subsequently can store that and use it fine. What about the next statement s set to 0? The registers they generally have a provision of resetting. So, if we are having a control line asserting that one can reset the whole register ok. So, that is there. Then what about the next statement that is the counter starts from 1 and then it increments by steps of 1. So, counter need to be initialized to 1. So, we can put another input control line for the counter that will reset it to 1 or even it starts from 0 does not matter. But since we are the designer we can design the internal structure, we can design the counter in such a way that the first state should be 0, sorry first state should be 1 ok. Now, the next statement which is the only arithmetic or logical statement in this algorithm, maybe it is a very simple algorithm, a trivial algorithm that is why only one statement is there in real life there will be thousands of them. So, how to implement this? S will be replaced by S plus I. So, S is a register which is holding the val value of the variable then I need to add i with them, i with this value. So, who can add? An adder obviously. So, this is uh, the symbol of an adder. Adder should have two operands as its input. One is s, another one is i, right. Now, where should I fit the output of the adder? Back to s. So, input of s should come from the output of the adder, right. Then anything else is required? 
hey, this control structure how to come out of the loop. So, who can check that whether the count i has passed in uh, there is some block I think you are aware of this uh, elements. So, there will be something uh, let us put some other color say this is a comparator. So, this comparator I think uh, everything it need not be uh, comp uh, need not compare just it will check whether n is falling short of i that is only when we find i is greater than n at that time it would generate some value or maybe it could be active low also. So, what should I do with this uh, comparator output? Uh, because this uh, registers they are usually having a clock signal attached to them which generally we do not draw it, it will look clumsy, but all this counter or registers they are having a clock signal whenever it gets a clock edge it tries to update itself. Okay. So, if we can stop this registers or counters then it will not update itself. Okay. So, this comparator output will go to the register S as well as the counter I which will say freeze. Okay. So, it is just opposite of count sometimes uh, the counters are having a signal called count. So, it is just opposite of count. Okay. So, when you are the designer you can design any signal whether it could be active low, active high whatever. Now, let us look into this why we need to stop the counter I is it required? If I argue that no it is just sufficient to freeze the register S because that is where from we will get the final result. Will it be correct? Uh, because in that case I will increment and since it is having finite number of bits after reaching the maximum count that is all ones it will reset back to 0. That means immediately the comparator will identify that I is now less than 1 it will release that uh, freeze statement and freezing line and once again S will start uh, updating itself. So, that is why it is required I should also be stopped. Now, what about the adder? Adder is something called a combinational logic as long as its inputs are there it will try to add whatever they are and trying to provide that at the output, but they are having some sort of delay associated with that. If I call that delay as T A propagation delay of the adder. So, as soon as I present the inputs to the uh, I mean input ports immediately the adder will not be able to say that this is the result. You need to wait for some definite amount of time I think maybe in your uh, MOS transistor fundamental it has been mentioned why this capacitances and other things that will try to delay the output. So, after finite time delay or rather I must say non-zero time uh, delay you will get the output over here. So, that actually defines the maximum speed of operation here because if someone asks how fast is your architecture I have to answer that question what are the things I need to uh, check at that time. For example, uh, if I say that I try to update the register very quickly. So, who updates the register? It is essentially the clock signal, right. So, clock signal is nothing but as we have mentioned it is a square wave. Registers are generally sensitive to just one edge either the rising edge or the falling edge. So, let us assume the registers are operating at the falling clock edge. So, whenever it finds a falling clock edge it updates itself. Whenever the next falling edge comes it will try to update itself once again. So, within two falling edges the adder should be able to add a new value and provide the output. We can just look at the structure once again. So, as we can see that after we get one output it will be latched in this register S and then the input to this adder will be refreshed I mean a new input will come. At the same time I is also getting updated it counts up and then a new input is arriving at the other port also. After T A time interval it will be able to provide a valid output and then we have to latch it. So, then what is the restriction? If I think about the clock pulse like this that suppose this is one falling edge this is another falling edge. So, the clock period is uh, let us say T clock. So, then what should be the relationship between this T clock and the propagation delay of the adder? T clock must be greater than T A otherwise what will happen if I try to clock it faster then the output of the adder has not settled yet and it will latch it means the register will latch some erroneous 
output ok. Now given that uh, uh, I mean for some particular adder this is the propagation delay we can find out what is the limiting speed of the clock just if I take the reciprocal of that we can find out what is the clock frequency we can use. Now how much time will be required for the final computation how to calculate in that case we need to know the maximum value of n which is supposed to come from the specification itself otherwise we have to ask that question back to I mean whomsoever has given the specification that what could be the maximum value of n depending on that we can identify how many cycles will be required we can now specify the performance of the circuit. But now we may have to look into the circuit once again and find out whether it is optimized one or not. So what do we mean by an optimized architecture in today's scenario generally three factors are very very important one is speed of the circuit which just now we have mentioned that how to calculate another one is area of the chip and a new dimension has been added particularly with the advent of the portable devices that is how much is the power consumption of the structure. So speed, area and power these three factors people are trying to optimize depending on the specific application. For example, where you require speed let us say you are having a personal communicator with you a mobile phone which is uh, which is capable of uh, let us say uh, sending video data at real time ok. So speed is extremely important there because unless we can maintain a frame rate of 25 frames per second or more then you will be having jerky pictures. So as you are aware that our persistence of vision is something like one tenth of a second. So if the picture changes uh, slower than one tenth of a second then we can find out that there is a change really. And, uh, if it is say more than 20 frames per second then as uh, generally happens in case of television we think that it is really there though actually it is moving at a very fast rate. So speed is extremely important there but in some other application you may find that speed is not that important for example uh, let us say some sort of biomedical implantation. So there maybe if it is something like biomedical implantable device then area would matter that where it will be put in inside the body there may not be very large area available. Then the power suppose if you are thinking of a pacemaker so obviously the user will not uh, like to recharge it just like a mobile or try to change the battery very often ok. So in those cases you need to think about the power also but maybe for some other application where we can take the power from the wall outlet that AC outlet of 230 volt then we need not bother about that one. So depending on the application we need to look into these three factors speed, area and power and maybe there could be some other specified application specific application where you can add more number of points which you may have to look into but typically these are the three factors. Now we will find that these factors to achieve them you require something contradictory for example if you require more speed then possibly you would like to put more hardware in parallel but that will increase the area and possibly the power also. If we look into the other side if we try to reduce area it will possibly tail up on the speed or sometimes power may be less but uh, uh, you may not like a very slow uh, chip or very slow system where the power requirement is very less. So it totally depends on the uh, application. Now let us look into whatever we have started with and look into its area requirement. So how to check whether it is optimized in terms of area what is the easiest way of reducing the area you can remove some blocks but if you remove any of these blocks the chip will not work ok. So you have to be very careful about their utilization apparently all of them are essential you cannot simply remove any of them. Now just look into their utilization that the clock cycles are coming clock pulses are coming somebody counts for example this counter is counting up this is updating itself. So if any of these blocks they are remaining unutilized so just have a look at this counter it is utilized in every clock cycle this is also getting updated in every clock cycle adder it does its duty in every clock cycle 
what about uh, this comparator and this uh, register n? n you are loading it just once, you are not changing it at all in the course of computation. What about comparator? Compare, uh, huh, yeah, it compares i because i is changing, so the input is changing, so it has to put the effort, but finally what it is giving, it is changing its output only once in the course of computation. So let us look into them. Can we simply remove them? What will be the effect? If we simply say that okay, n is not there, this register is not there, comparator is not there, what will be the problem? It will run past the value of n where we try to stop it. Now let us look at the specification once again. We are starting from this one, so we want to stop here. If we remove them, it is not stopping, it is going past that. Now if we can start from the opposite side what will be the situation? We can always stop at 1, whatever be the value of n, we need not keep the value stored. So can we have some sort of small modification in our structure, so that n need not be stored explicitly? So right, so in the algorithm where we said for i equal to 1 to n, maybe if we try to just change that statement, we simply say it is n down to 1. We are not making any fee change in the algorithm, we are not trying at all to uh, change the order of computation, whatever the algorithm people could have done as we have shown by this uh, closed form formula. So we are not trying something. From our knowledge of VLSI or so called uh, hardware implementation, we find out that okay, we can remove that in that uh, register apparently if we use this n down to 1 that type of statement. Now what will be the change in the structure in that case? So the n register we can remove and then it will be simply the register s and then counter i. Now i itself can latch the value of n as its starting point. So instead of using a simple up counter as in the previous case, what we are using? We are using a down counter, but the down counter is a loadable one. Earlier we have started with one, we need not use something like a loadable kind of stuff, but right now whatever we are using, it is called a loadable down counter. Okay, so we can load the value of n and then it started counting down from that value and finally what will be the value it will be reaching? So anyway, the adder will be required in this case also because that is the main component here, only one logical or arithmetic operation is there, output of that one should once again go back to the register S. Now how to stop this one? Here essentially we are making some statement S equal to n plus n minus 1 plus n minus 2 and so on. So finally 2, then it will be 1 and then we have to stop. Right. So, who can stop this counter? Once again, if we remove the comparator, then we need to check whether the counter is becoming 0 or not. Because last value we need to add is 1, till that time the other register should get updated. Only when this register falls to 0, we need to stop the whole process. So, who can check whether the counter is all uh, 0 means all the bits must be 0. Right. So if I think about some gate who can generate a signal when all the bits are 0, what is that gate? Ha, or gate becomes 0, so it is something like this that if we are having uh, let us say a logical OR gate here, it depends on the number of inputs, suppose the counter is 8 bits, so it should be an 8, 8 bit logical ORing, output of that one will be 0, right, as soon as all the bits are 0. So this one we feed back here where generally it is called a load signal for that register and similarly for the counter it is the count signal. So count signal now if it falls to 0 that means it is no more counting, right. So that is what we have got now as the so called area optimized design where now you will see that almost all the blocks are utilized fully. And the OR gate, this is just used as a comparator, but if you remember the comparator internal structure, 
it is much more than OR gate, there are several XOR or XNOR gates and there will be once again something like a logical OR gate or AND gate. So, this structure we can say it is optimized in terms of area, speed more or less it will remain same because it is governed by the propagation delay of the adder. Now, there is just one point uh, here, whenever we try to make this architecture, we can have two distinct components there. One is whatever is drawn in red, that is called data path. Data path as the name suggests, the path through which the data travels. So, data is traveling from this, it is coming through this and I have not shown the output explicitly. The output from S should once again be taken to some other bus, maybe output bus or somewhere. Okay. So, the whole thing is known as data path. What are there in the data path? Primarily data path is composed of registers, even a counter is uh, you can think of it as a special register, a register attached with an incrementer. Okay. So, data path generally is having registers plus this adder we can refer to this as something like a combinational design or combinatorial network. What is a combinatorial network? which does not require any clock, where you are simply feeding the operands with the operands after some non-zero propagation delay, it can provide the output. So, it is always unambiguous in terms of the present inputs, you can always specify what will be the output. So, that we refer to as combinational network. Now, the other thing which is drawn in blue, that is called control. As obvious, it is controlling the whole structure. So, in terms of algorithm also, this registers and uh, whatever combinational networks are there, they are primarily responsible for holding the variables and modifying them using some arithmetic or logical operations. And the control structure, it tries to implement the control statements in the algorithm, namely the loop structure or some conditional statements. So, I think in this structure, we have not yet uh, encountered any conditional statement, the flow is pretty straightforward. Now, we can look into some typical control structures, which we might encounter in any uh, general algorithm. For example, uh, here we have shown already how to implement a for loop. So, another one could be something like if. Okay, so, if there is some condition, so this type of statement you often encounter. If some condition, then you do something else, you do something else. Right. So, how to implement such thing? Then this condition, whatever it actually refers to, you have to first evaluate that. A typical statement could look like this, if A equals B, then R is P minus Q, else R is P minus X. Okay. So, now how to implement such thing? First of all, we have to evaluate the condition, we have to test for this condition. So, as apparent here, we would require some sort of comparator. So, the comparator inputs will be coming from two registers who are responsible for holding the values of A and B, right. So, there must be some other portion of the algorithm which says how to calculate A and B. So, they must be on, uh, I mean above this statements. Now, the comparator is just maybe say it is a just equality comparator. So, it provides high output if the condition is true. So, now it talks about the updating of the register R, that what would be the content of R? R would be P minus Q if this is true, otherwise it will be P minus X. So, how do you do that? First of all, uh, I mean maybe this is a specific case where we have got the same kind of operations here. If they are different, then you have to tackle it in slightly different way. So, let us just look at this where the operations are same. So, we can use something called a subtractor to do that. So, the so called data path that is straightforward that we are having some register R at the output of a subtractor. So, this is the subtractor, output will become the value of R. Now, one operand once again is common that is P. So, we need not uh, uh, have to bother about that. So, one input will come from P. What about the other input? 
Huh. So, there you require some component who will decide that what will come here. So, here as we find that either we have to pick up Q or we have to pick up X. So, maybe uh, the component that you are referring to is a multiplexer. So, multiplexer can choose from two inputs, maybe in one we have to put Q, in another we have to put X. So, the control line coming from the comparator output will be deciding whether I am taking Q or I am taking X. So, this is connected to port 1, this is connected to port 0. So, if comparator output is high, that means then clause we are executing, then the max output will be Q, otherwise it will be X. So, then we connect the max to this. Now, what will be the changes here? For example, if the statement is slightly more complicated, where we may find that these operands are not common. Let us say it is P minus Q, it is say Y minus X then we require maybe two different multiplexers at each of the ports. Then it could be completely different operations. Here both the operations are identical, they are subtraction. Suppose here it is P minus Q, here it is Y into X. So then you require two different data path elements, okay, two different combinational blocks. One is subtractor, another may be multiplier. So depending on the kind of structure you have to work with. Now, sometimes if the algorithm is not given to you in a structured form, but rather we have to poke our nose into uh, uh, structuring that algorithm, then sometimes we might fall into some sort of uh, potholes you can say. Okay. So, uh, let us just uh, uh, think about one or two examples and then I will try to explain what we particularly mean about those potholes. For example, you may find, uh, achha, just uh, mm, do you know what is meant by decoder or demultiplexer? Are you aware of uh, these structures or? Uh, okay, then I think uh, maybe we can, uh, you are aware of this adder, multiplexer, etc. Okay, you can flip flops, I think. Okay, so let us look into some uh, uh, statement which you have got while trying to uh, make an algorithm. Let us say if P is greater than Q, then R is maximum of P or Q, else R is minimum of P and Q. So, how to implement this statement? How many multiplexers, how many blocks, do you require some functional blocks where you will be computing minimum and maximum? A typical uh, operation could be you compare P and Q, okay. So, maybe if you compare P and Q, then maybe depending on whether they are greater than or not, you decide something that okay, there is a max, okay, whose input is coming from some minimum computation block and then maximum computation block, right. So, that is what I am trying to tell you about those potholes that here actually this statement itself is very redundant one. Okay, what it means? It is always R is P, right. So, if you can identify this, then immediately you know that the whole structure is not required, nothing like mean, max, etc. But anyway, it is uh, interesting to identify how you can compute minimum or maximum. What will be inside this block if you really have to compute minimum somewhere? A comparator and maybe a multiplexer which will decide similarly for maximum also. Okay, so, this structure as we have found out that this is basically a redundant structure and you can remove them. So, maybe here it is very easy to identify that this structure is redundant, but sometimes what happens in a complex algorithm unless you look into that one very closely, it becomes difficult to identify whether it is uh, something like a trivial or redundant structure. Okay. Just uh, let us say, if you look into this that how to compute, let us say P equal to, uh, you are aware of this mod function, right? Say mod n comma 8, where n is a number, let us say given by a 16 bit 
okay 16 bit wide number n. So, mod n 8 how do you interpret that? If you divide n by 8 what will be the remainder? So, first of all we have to identify how many bits will be required to store p. Let us say n it is mentioned let us say 16 bit. Okay, so 16 bit means what is the minimum value if it is unsigned? Suppose we are not talking about uh, negative numbers, it will be 0 to 2 to the power, uh, what is that number? 655, 5, because 1 less than that. Okay. So, it is in this range. So, now we understand for storing n, we require 16 bit register. What will be the length of the register? How many bits? will be required to store p 3 bits because whenever we are dividing some number by 8 the remainder has to be in the range of 0 to 7 whatever be the size of n irrespective of that. So, for this one we require only 3 bit. Now, how do you compute that remainder? Do you require something like a divider, a subtractor or something else? Remember in decimal system, if someone tells us divide a number by let us say 1000. Uh, so, we need to just shift the decimal point. Here we are talking about binary numbers where the number base is 2. So, when we try to talk about or try to divide some number or multiply some number by powers of 2, then the operation is exactly similar as shifting the decimal point, it is just a binary point that you are shifting. So, when we talk about the integer, the point is invisible, point is always at the right hand most end. So, in that case, what will be the structure? Okay, let us uh, look into some number. So, just uh, pick up some example. Suppose, uh, uh, rather than taking 16 bit, just for example, I am taking maybe a 6 bit number, which will be easier to identify. Suppose, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, what is its uh, decimal value? 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. So, that is 24, right? 24. So, if I divide it by 8, what will be the remainder? Will be 0. So, that is because here these 3 bits are all 0. Okay. You can look into this 1, 2, 4, this weight is 8 then 16, 32 and so on. So, apparently the point is here. So, if we say we are dividing by 2 to the power 3, it is essentially shifting of this point. In other words, I can shift the weights like this, that this weight is coming over here, this is over here, then point, after that there will be 0, 0, 0. Okay. So, this portion is the remainder. So, if you can think of any other number, if you divide it by 8, then whatever is there in this portion, that part will remain. So, the block for computing this mod n 8 will be nothing but a block. If you have to show all the 16 bits as its input, that is fine. But finally, you need to take only the 3 LSBs. Okay. Similarly, maybe in some other blocks, you will find that uh, you can do some sort of optimization over there. One such example is say squaring unit. So, what is a squaring unit? That is you are uh, having a variable let us say x, you want y equal to x square. So, one would be tempted to use a multiplier where the same operands you will be putting as x and x output will obviously be x square but that will be some sort of you can say under utilization of the power of the multiplier because the inputs are not different. It is just x into x the same operands you are doing. Okay. So, once again you can optimize it to some extent rather than using a bulky multiplier. So, let us look into just one or two uh, bits of that uh, squaring unit then it will become very apparent. Suppose, uh, you are having uh, let us say we start with a 3 bit number or 4 bit number. So, first of all, if we identify that y equal to x square, this we have to do, then maybe this is the block where x is being input. Let us say I am assuming x is 4 bit wide. 
So we have to identify what will be the width of y. How much will be the width of y? Uh, so just by finding out the, what could be the maximum number, we can identify. Now if these are the bits, we may represent them by x0, x1, x2, x3. So what is that? The variable x, we are combining, I mean we are having these 4 bits. So the minimum value x can have is all 0, right? Then the next higher value could be 1 and then all 1 that is 15. So x value could be 0 to 15. So y value in that case what is 15 square? 225. So it could be 0 to 225. 225 means how many bits we require? 8 bits. Okay, 0 to 255 we can represent by 8 bits. So output would be 8 bit wide. Now what would be the uh, relationship between those output bits and the input bits? So output will be 8 bit wide up to y7 we may say y1 and so on. So how to calculate y0? If we make a statement that square of an odd number is always odd and square of even number is always even, is it true? Huh? Because 2n square that is 4n square, 2n whole square I mean, okay. So even number square will be always even, odd number will be always odd. So LSB that gives the characteristics of odd or even. If LSB is high, it is an odd number, otherwise it is an even number. So the LSB I can directly connect from the input to output because if this is 0, output LSB will also be 0, otherwise if it is 1, output LSB will be 1. What about the second bit Y1? So whatever we are mentioning that if X is even, that means X0 is 0, then we can identify Y equal to something like 2 n square, so it will be 4 n square. So 4 n square obviously is an even number. Now what about if x is odd, we may represent it by 2n plus 1. So then y will be equal to 2n plus 1 square that is 4n square plus 4n plus 1. So this portion obviously is even and this last one that we are representing as the odd uh, LSB. Okay? Now what about the rest of the part, once we have taken out this LSB, the other bits that will be responsible for representing the whole number in this case the LSB is 0, in this case LSB is 1. Now we can find out that the whole number is divisible by 4. This one also after taking out the LSB, this portion is also divisible by 4. Now what is its implication? If the number is divisible by 4, what will be this bit? This will be 0. So no element will be required. Here there will be a simple ground connection. So in that way you can proceed and find that if you compare it with a so called multiplier structure, then it is much more economic whenever we are talking about the squarer. Okay? So that is how we are trying to minimize the hardware or uh, sometimes we, uh, we may not require to minimize the hardware, but we try to simply reduce the delay. So here it reduces the delay also because if we have put something, some uh, element over there that will take propagation delay etc. It will compute finally maybe the same thing. If you are having an XOR gate with two inputs uh, tied together, the output will become 0. But as soon as the input changes, it will take some time to settle. Once again, it will switch uh, back and forth. Okay. Now, here is something we have mentioned about the area. But other than that, for today's technology, people are more bothered about the speed because right now whatever the state of the art VLSI design we can really target the real time applications. In earlier days what was happening, uh, you know about the microprocessor chips, right? So in the early days of the microprocessor, the VLSI designers, they are coming up with a new microprocessor and they are saying that, okay, you see, we have designed this microprocessor which can run, let us see, with a clock speed of 3 megahertz. So the system designer now, they have to design the system conforming to that particular specification or the limit of the clock speed. Now what is happening? Because of the uh, I mean, advancement of the technology, now it is becoming so fast that the system designers are more and more optimistic. They try to take up some real time challenges. Now when it is real time, you cannot compromise on the speed as just now we have mentioned, we cannot change our persistence of vision. 
So when we say it's a real time communicator, we have to satisfy that much of frame rate that it has to be at least 20 frames per second or more than that. As per standard, maybe 25 frames per second. We cannot compromise on that. So then system designers, they are telling the VLSI designer that see, this is my requirement. You have to design a chip which can satisfy this type of clock speed. Okay. So the pressure is from the other side. So it is not only that if you say that, okay, I have designed something where the area is optimized, uh, the system designers will be happy. They say that, no, uh, you may use more area. I don't bother about the area, but I require speed at any cost. You may put 10 times more area, I don't mind. Okay. So there comes something called, say, parallel processing, as all of you are aware, that if we can break up a task into smaller subtasks and then try to implement that in parallel, then combine the result. So one, uh, let us say example, it could be like this, say uh, a typical example of uh, multiplying say four digit number by another four digit number, suppose six, seven, uh, seven, six, five, four multiplied by let us say one, two, nine, eight. Okay. So if we are having some machine which can compute uh, one digit by one digit multiplication in some amount of time. Then if we do it sequentially, then we can find out how much time is required, but we can really break it up and find out that, okay, what we are doing in the first step, we are multiplying the whole thing by only eight and writing the result over here. So it is essentially multiplying the whole thing by eight. Then we are multiplying the whole thing by nine and so on by two and by one. Okay. And then finally we are combining the result. Now we can engage four such processors that will be able to compute four digit by one digit number, then that can be done in parallel and finally one combiner should be there where the placement should be proper and some addition will be required. Okay, so in that way we can break it up into a parallel operations. But parallel operation always might not uh, yield a very fast uh, uh, I mean, uh, result. For example, if you think of a real time uh, operation. So here maybe we are uh, taking something like an unitary system uh, that if I can engage four persons, then if I con uh, maybe uh, I consider the summation of the whole thing that takes much uh, short, uh, shorter time compared to the other operations. So barring that overhead, we can see if we engage four persons, we can do the job four times fast. Okay. But in real life, you think of, uh, let us say, if you know that it takes uh, uh, 9 seconds to drive a nail in the wall and you engage 9 persons in the hope that they will do it in 1 second, that will not be correct. So here that is essential where you try to find out that how to distribute the job. Okay, so it is completely essential that they are not trying to do something where the result of one operation is dependent on the other. But in many cases, you will find that this type of uh, breaking up is not possible. For example, many algorithms you find they are sequential. So if we can look at the algorithm structure, we may find, okay, this is a block where some input parameters are coming and then we compute something. We may call it say block one. I'm talking about algorithm, nothing else. So there are some statements. Okay. Then the output of that is going to another one. We may call it block two. Then there are something we may call block three and so on. Now we may have definite hardware. So here maybe this is the algorithmic level design and here for each of them, we may have some sort of hardware blocks okay, that can carry out this task, whatever is mentioned in the algorithm. So we may have some hardware block for each of them. We may call them say P1, then process two and then process three. So the output of process one that will go to process two, then only it can process the result and so on. Output of P2 will go to P3 and so on. So we cannot start with the primary input and we can break it up into parallel operations. It is essentially a sequential flow. But what we can do? We can do something called pipelining. Whatever earlier we have done is something called parallel processing. But here we can do something called pipelining. What is the basic concept of pipelining? Let us assume that after designing this hardware, it takes 
let us say 2 nanosecond of time for this computation. Let us say the next block it takes 3 nanosecond of time for its computation. Let us say the next block it takes uh, once again let us say 2 nanosecond for its computation. So, if you provide some input over here how much time it will take to get the final output? It is 2 plus 3 plus 2 that is uh, how much 7 nanosecond. So, only after 7 nanosecond you can put here some new set of data and then you can get the output. So, we generally used to define the rate of the output or the processing rate in terms of throughput. Throughput means in unit time how much is the or how many outputs are coming or in other words you can say throughput is one output every in this case one output every 7 nanosecond right. So, the data processing capability in terms of speed is one set of input or one set of output every 7 nanosecond. So, if I put a register over here, how quickly I can update that with a new set? 7 nanosecond, not before that there could be some margin because there would be always some statistical variation this might not be exactly 7 nanosecond and so on. So, this bound is 7 nanosecond, I cannot do it faster than that. Now, the concept of pipelining is such think about some assembly line job where there are three persons doing some sort of sub assembly. So, maybe in this table the job is first passed and then this person does something on that put something or uh, some block then that is passed to the second table. By that time this table is free. So, this person is capable of handling another job. In that way if you think of then how quickly you can pass it, but then you require some sort of intermediate storage here or here because if you are going to change it after some time, then you have to ensure that the temporary output or uh, the intermediate output of P1 that is not getting lost. So, we are putting some intermediate register to store the intermediate outputs of these blocks. So, now how quickly we can really update this? 3 nanosecond. Three nanosecond. Why 3 nanosecond? not 2 nanosecond Haan, because otherwise what will happen if you try to update this within 2 nanosecond then here there will be overcrowding ok. So, in this case register it cannot handle more than one data at a time. So, the previous data will be overwritten. So, whoever is the slowest link in the chain that will govern the speed in this if I consider this to be something like a conveyor belt in the assembly line. So, now after this so called pipelining what is the uh, effective throughput after doing this pipelining how fast I can uh, one output every 3 nanosecond ok. But that gives rise to another thing it, it should not give us a notion that uh, as soon as we put it here within 3 nanosecond the job will be done over here. So, how long it will take that is called latency. So, throughput is improved from 7 nanosecond now it is 3 nanosecond we can put new data every 3 nanosecond. But what is the so called latency? Latency is what? When you put a data here how long it will take to come here? When you are having a throughput of one output every 7 nanosecond. So, at that time the latency was 7 nanosecond after 7 nanosecond you are getting the output. So, have you got any improvement on this latency? So, what is the value now? Sure just check you are not updating this one after 2 nanosecond ok. So, you are updating it only after 3 nanosecond you are updating also this one after 3 nanosecond. So, how much time the data takes from travelling from the first register to this second register it is 3 nanosecond though the block is finishing its job by 2 nanosecond because of another slower link in the chain this cannot pass it within 2 nanosecond it has to wait there for another 1 nanosecond. So, it is basically 3 nanosecond in each stage how many stages are there 3 stages. So, in every stage it will be 3 nanosecond. So, the latency is actually increased to 9 nanosecond ok. So, that is the drawback you are having latency of 9 nanosecond, but the throughput rate is increased. So, once the pipeline is filled that is the first data will come out after 9 nanosecond, but once the pipeline is filled then you will find that after every 3 nanosecond the data is coming. Okay. Now, you are happy with this structure 
you let us say uh, go to the system designer and say that okay, you see some new thing I have designed. Earlier you are uh, encountering a throughput rate of only 7 nanosecond uh, and now it is 3 nanosecond. Every 3 nanosecond you can gi uh, give the output. Now the system designer seems not to be that much happy. He or she said to you that no, 3 nanosecond even is not good enough. I require for my new uh, whatever system that has already been announced in the market that it will be there in uh, another month's time. So there we require one output every nanosecond. So it should be three times faster. So then what would you do? Ha, first thing you would try which possibly uh, we, you, you may not be uh, successful to break it up vertically whether this one is having two levels of gates whether you can put another intermediate latch within that breaking it into one nanosecond. Similarly you can try to break it up into three modules having one nanosecond delay each and one second by two. But it might so happen that this block is something where it is indivisible. Let us assume that. So I think someone is saying parallel uh, processing, right? So then we may have how many such pipes will be required then? Three pipes. So each of them will be handling uh, every third data, right? So if we can put three such pipes, so let us say this is one pipe, this is another pipe this is another pipe. So the input is coming to all the three simultaneously but with proper clocking scheme you are putting the registers into action by a skewed manner. Maybe the first data that is entering you are latching it here maybe I may call it data number 0. Here you may put data number 1, here you may put data number 2. So the third data will come over here. So between two successive data, 3 nanosecond time is there. Here also 1 and 4, so 3 nanosecond time is there. Now what will happen at the output, after 9 nanosecond this data will come out first, 10th nanosecond you will get the data from here, 11th nanosecond you will get it from here, once again 12th nanosecond you will get the data from here. So if you can have some mechanism to pass them properly, something uh, similar to multiplexing, generally call it a tri-state buffer, you know what is a tri-state buffer? You can just make both of them tri-stated that is it is not holding the bus and one tri-state buffer on. So in that way from three different pipes you can take them. So now this is a combination of parallel processing and pipelining right that we have judiciously combined to make the throughput rate uh, I mean satisfy the system requirement. So now what is the throughput rate here? one output every nanosecond, one nanosecond. What is the latency? Latency is still 9 nanosecond, we cannot help that, right. Now you are happy, system designer is also happy. Now you find that your competitor company, they have announced something where you find the chip size is less than that. So let us look into this the same way as we have seen earlier. So here there are three blocks. 1 takes 2 nanosecond, 3, 2 nanosecond. Here are also there are 3 blocks, 2 nanosecond, 3 nanosecond and 2 nanosecond. Here also there are 3 blocks, 2 nanosecond, 3 nanosecond and 2 nanosecond. So I mean intermediate registers are there, I am not drawing a, a detailed sketch. So now how to check whether you can remove some of the blocks? Just the same principle as we have applied earlier. Let us check whether all the blocks are getting utilized for all the time. If that is not, we will try to remove some of them if possible. So let us talk about this block, whether this block is working for 100 percent of its time, how much it is working? Huh, two third of that time, 66.67 percent. So this block, the same thing, for this block also the same thing. So what unitary system tells us once again, that three persons doing two third of uh, job and one third time they are sleeping, so you can fire one of them, right. So similar thing for the last um, part also, but for the middle one you cannot help, they are always busy in their job. So technically you can say that we will put only two blocks that will take up two nanoseconds. For the second block you require three number of blocks that takes three nanoseconds. 
for third level or third process you once again require two. But now the interconnections becomes uh, uh, some uh, complicated thing it appears. What about the input? Input anyway there will be intermediate uh, register for each of them input registers. So, you can latch them in proper timing. So, they will pick up alternate data right. First of one let us say it picks up even number of samples say 0, 2, 4, 6, 8. This will pick up odd number of sample 1, 3, 5, 7, 9 etcetera. Now, what about this? Let us say the output of the first sample that is 0th sample, it takes 2 nanosecond to process. You want it to work for 100 percent of time. So, that means after 2 nanosecond it has to pass the data let us say to the first processor. So, 0th data comes here. After 1 nanosecond what will happen? I mean after another 1 nanosecond that is at the third nanosecond the output pertaining to the first sample will come. So, this is still busy we have to put it over here. So, here it will pick up 1. Now, because they are taking alternate data. So, this second sample output will come after 1 nanosecond of this. So, then where can I put this? This is still busy because this will remain busy for 3 nanoseconds. So, this is not yet free. So, I need to put it over there. So, data number 2 should go there. What about data number 3 which will come out from this? First processor will get free by that time. So, it will pick up 3. This will pick up 4, this will pick up 5, this will pick up 6, this will pick up 7, this will pick up 8. So, as if I mean once again that mod function, this is something like mod 0, if you divide it by 3, this is mod 1, this is mod 2, ok. So, what will be the interconnection between these blocks? Earlier when it was simple parallel processing, you are having simply 3 pipes. But now, can you tell me what would be the interconnection? It will be all processor to all processor? Seems to be right. So, for the uh, second level of interconnection that is the interconnection between second and third layer, what would be it, uh, it would be like once again it would process every alternate data 0, 2, 4, 6, 8 etcetera here it will be 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. So, as it appears this will take 0 means from the first one, 2 means from this one, 4 means from this one. So, once again all to all is required. So, what will be the complexity of the interconnection? Is it increasing quite a lot? So, if we say that we are uh, buying uh, maybe the uh, area optimization in terms of interconnection complexity will it be true. But you see a simple bus connection would satisfy the requirement. Why? Because at any particular time instant only one of them will be talking right because otherwise that block is redundant. If simultaneously two blocks can provide data then one block is not necessary at all because they are not being able to that is why we need to put another block. So, only one block is talker and anyway if one gives data to the bus many can listen to it, but still here only one will be listening. So, here clocking scheme will be such that here we will put the tri state buffers, we will activate only one buffer depending on which time instant we are talking about and here we will latch it only in one register. So, the clock signal goes to the pertinent register only right. Similar situation will be there for second to third level also that it will be a simple bus with 3 stripes tri state buffers put over here. For example, in 0th state this will be on this will be on, in first state this will be on this will be on, in second this will be on this will be on like that ok. And finally, at the last level there will be 2 tri state buffers whose outputs are taken together to the final output bus ok. Now, how much uh, difficult will be the control scheme because you need to generate the switching signals, maybe interconnection complexity you have reduced just by putting a simple bus, but what about the uh, logic that will control this. So, as you can see that they are taking something like an alternate data. So, a so called divide by 2 counter or just a single flip flop will be able to do the job. Here this is something like every third data so a 3 I mean mod 3 counter we call it. So, a modulo 3 counter if you use it will be enough. Similarly, if I mean maybe the, for a simple problem I have shown only 2 or 3 if it is n number of modules in general then I require a mod n counter over there ok. So, here let us look into this. So, area is reduced compared to the previous structure how much by one block of this and one block of that. So, we may say it is area optimized whether there is any effect on the throughput no throughput is same ok. So, one data or one output every every nanosecond. 
what about latency is there any change in the latency yes but uh, in which direction for better or for worse because nobody is holding the data so let us say at the first level the data is staying only for 2 nanosecond after that data is coming here there will be at least one block ready to pick up that data it takes 3 nanosecond after that it provides it to the bus there will be someone ready to accept it so it is 7 nanosecond so once again that is the lower bound of that because anyway the combinational blocks are there their delay you are not reducing at least at this moment so that is the lower bound you can touch so this is the final structure where you find that this is an area optimized design speed anyway we have optimized at the very beginning and also the latency which is another uh, feature power we are uh, right now not talking about but typically what happens if you reduce some block then though the power is related to the activity if activity is more the power consumption is more so two blocks they are actually taking up uh, more uh, activity now but as such the leakage power also that is nowadays quite large okay so other than that now uh, people are talking about for example power okay so let us just very quickly look into uh, the power aspect why the circuit the digital circuits they consume power i think you had already a lecture on mos fundamental so you are aware where the power consumptions are there okay so can you just uh, prompt me that what are the various components of power consumption this is a simple inverter so the operational logic is like this when the input is 0 this is p type MOS then it is on output will be high and when the input is high at that time this n transistor this is on so output is low. So as we can find out that whether the input is 0 or 1 only one transistor is on at a time other is off. So there is no path from the power supply to ground okay so it should not consume any power right but we find that there is a huge power consumption so why this one consumes power yes one is leakage even if one transistor is off it will be having some leakage power. but that is not that much significant significant is something else that is it is driving some more structure that will be a possibly another gate or something so it will be essentially having a load capacitance that it has to drive so whenever we are changing the state from 1 to 0 or 0 to 1 the capacitor is getting charged or discharged for example if initially the capacitor may not be having any charge this is getting charged up from this okay and when it changes state to 0 this will get discharged from that so may not be that uh, simultaneously two transistors are on but at one time it charges the capacitor the other time it is discharging that so how fast is this transition happening depending on that it will try to pump the charge from the power supply line and dumping it onto the ground line so that is called dynamic power or the switching power other than that there will be some non ideality in the switches and uh, it is true that it is not an instantaneous process that whenever it becomes 0 to 1 so it takes some non zero time to rise to that value in that period what is happening both the transistors are moderately conducting giving rise to something called a short circuit current so there are three components one is that switching power another is short circuit power another one is leakage power okay so out of which i mean in present day leakage is also becoming significant compared to the switching and short circuit power because as the device dimensions are becoming smaller and smaller this uh, switching and short circuit powers are getting scaled down and leakage is not getting scaled down but sometimes it is even more depending on the defects and other problems so we are not going into that details but it is clear i think that if we do some sort of switching then it consumes power right in the steady state it is only the leakage power now uh, i think uh, in your digital class maybe you will be encountering some problem where you are asked to design a four input and gate using only two input and gates okay so the solution is simple right you can put how many two input and gates will be required to make uh, four input and gates three so how to put them together two input and gates another two input and gates together output once again you put it like this if i call them something like say a b c d 
so the output is y. So that is a simple solution, right? Maybe some of your fellow student has solved the problem like this that uh, let us say this is y, here there is another level of gate, another level of gate. So maybe if I call it a, b, c, d. So this is also logically valid, right? Only the topology is different. So now can you compare these two? Which one is better? Which one is worse? First one is better. Why? Latency of the propagation delay is less, okay? How much less? If it is uh, just, uh, I mean, in terms of gate delay, if we mention, it is two gate delays here. Here it is, worst case is three gate delays, okay? Now, let us say where we can have this type of structures uh, utilized. Maybe we are having a counter, a 4 bit counter, which starts counting from 0000. Maybe I can term the outputs as A, B, C, D. It starts from all 0, it counts up, and finally, we try to find out when it reaches the final count, all ones. Okay? So, what will be the kind of uh, output y? y will be totally flat only in the last state, it will become high, once again it will fall down if it becomes 0 and so on. In this case also it will be like this. Okay? Now what about its power consumption? Look into this node. How often do you think it will change its state? If we go into this one, there will be 1, 0, there will be 1, 1. Okay? So as soon as it is 1, 1, this will shoot up and then it will become 0, 0, once again. So after how many such switching, this final switching will occur? When C and D there 0, 0, at that time they will become 1, 1. Then when C and D this is 0 and 1, it will become high once again. Once again it will become 1 and 0, at that time also it will be high. But till that time, since this node is 0, the output node is not switching. Only in the fourth instant, when both of them are high, at that time it will become high, final output will be high. Right? So, this node is having unnecessary switching of 3 times out of 4, only useful is this one. Now think about this structure. Here, a is switching quite fast, 0, 1, 0, 1, almost in every clock cycle A is switching. But as long as this node is held at 0, this will not change. What about B? B is also changing, maybe at half of the rate of this one. But unless this is 0, changing this one will not change the state of this node. So only when C and D both are high, that is only in the last quarter of all these codes, then it will become 1. Then only when B will become high, it will become high. Then only in the last case when A will become high, this will become high. So you can reduce unnecessary switching over there. So maybe you are correct when you think in terms of speed, the first one is better. But if you think in terms of power, the second one is better. So if it is not in the so-called critical path, what is critical path? As you have seen in the previous diagram, you have told that the pipelining speed would be governed by the slowest chain. So that slowest link between two registers, we call that critical path. The other ones, they are not in the critical path. So if this portion is not in the critical path, whether you make this one or that one, that will not alter the overall system speed, but that will save some power. Moreover, sometimes it might so happen that here, the input to output delay for all the inputs to output, they are same, two gate delays. But here, at least there is one input which let us say in this condition when B, C, D both are, I mean all the three inputs are high, whenever A is changing from 0 to 1, just after one propagation delay it will become high. So if you look into the last transition, it will take more time because A and B this will settle, then it will settle. But here they are already high, at that time A was 0, now A as soon as becomes 1, just after one propagation delay, it can become high. So it is not also always true that in terms of speed, it is uh, worse. But if you can order these inputs properly, then 
you can really take the mileage out of it. Just think about the opposite combination. If I have provided A, B, C, D in this order, whether it will be able to save power? No, because A and B once again this node will switch quite often. Okay? So that is how at the logic level or at the gate level you can save some power. But that is what I mean uh, we can uh, stop at this point because the other thing that you can use for saving power that will go down to the device level and particularly with today's short channel uh, or this very small geometry transistors leakage power is no more insignificant. Okay, so for very large structure let us say memory and other thing, memory means you are having millions of cells, maybe just one or two cells are active only at a time. So this activity related power consumption that is switching or short circuit they are much less compared to millions multiplied by maybe a very small amount of leakage power. Okay. So I think maybe in uh, other sessions if you are having a low power uh, circuit design I think maybe on 8. So at that time they will be discussed. So we stop at this point this is just the beginning as you can understand that there are uh, many such uh, optimization technique that uh, you can utilize. So I think if you are having any question here we can uh, try to address it here itself or you can uh, I mean as we are aware that you can access me offline also. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.